So today's topic is the Civil War, and uh, I'll focus on a little bit on the biographies of a few of the uh, more important political and military figures in the war, like Grant, Lee, and Lincoln. So I want to start with uh, Lincoln, who was the president throughout the Civil War. Uh, I should have put a picture of him on this first page, but I forgot. But this is uh, uh, the farm site where he grew up in Indiana, obviously a reconstructed cabin, I'm sure. So he was born in 1809 in Kentucky uh, and moved to Indiana uh, when he was about seven, uh, about 1816. Uh, this was very important because Kentucky, of course, was a slave state in Indiana, a state where slavery was illegal. So this had a huge impact on his childhood and on his upbringing. And I've heard stories that suggested that one of the reasons they moved from Kentucky to Indiana might have been that his father was uncomfortable with the practice of slavery and didn't like uh, being around it, and so moved to Lee, which is entirely plausible. Uh, a major event in his life, his mom died when he was only about nine years old. Uh, his dad remarried, and uh, the woman he married became a like a mother to Lincoln. In fact, he called her mother and became deeply attached to her even more than to his own father. One of the interesting things about him is that uh, when he was young, um, even though he was even though he was a quite capable uh, worker and uh, you know excellent worker, he his family considered him lazy because he loved to read, uh, and whenever he could, he would just sort of sit around reading books. Uh, he was mostly self-educated; he had almost no opportunity to go to school. Uh, but he read on his own uh, the King James Bible, Aesop's Fables, uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Um, if you pay attention to his speeches, to his writings, you can see um, a heavy influence from the Bible. He obviously read very, very carefully, very many times, the King James Bible, and made allusions to constantly. So, in 1831, his family moved to Illinois, and this is, of course, where he would make his legal and political mark uh, on the world. Um, one of the formative events of his life was around this time, so he would have been around in his early 20s, maybe 21, 22. He and some of his friends took a flat boat to New Orleans, and what they did, which was very common in those days, is they loaded up the boat. The flat boat was just like a raft, basically. They loaded it up with goods, and they floated it down the river. And when they got to New Orleans, they sold everything, like everything on the boat and even the wood on the boat itself, just uh, sold it all, and then they walked back home. And this was a common uh, form of commerce for farmers in the West and in Indiana, Illinois, places like that. Uh, to float their goods down to New Orleans and sell it for everything they could and then walk back. But this was a, an important event in his life because this was the first time that he was exposed to slavery. In New Orleans, he saw slave auctions and he was horrified and developed a lifelong distaste uh, for slavery, revulsion for slavery. Um, he married in 1842, so he would have been, what, 33 or so? And he had four children with his wife, Mary Todd. Um, his family life was basically marked by tragedy, though. Um, Mary Todd, his wife, was kind of mentally unstable and at one point was committed to an, to an asylum by her son. Uh, this was after Lincoln's death. Uh, of his four children, only one reached adulthood. The others died uh, before Lincoln did. Uh, so... Uh, he was known to suffer from melancholy, they called it, which we would probably identify as depression, clinical depression. Uh, and even during his presidency, he would sometimes go um, silent for hours where he would not speak, not move, not respond. He would just be so overwhelmed with depression. And surely the death of three of his uh, sons at early ages contributed to that. So... <clears throat> 
Lincoln entered politics as a fairly young man. Uh, in 1834, he began serving in the Illinois State Legislature and served in the state legislature for eight years. He was a member of the Whig Party, and he was a follower of Henry Clay. And this means that he was in favor of what they called internal improvements, like transportation projects, like canals and railroads and things like that. He also adopted a free soil stance, which was the attitude of many Whigs towards slavery. And this was, he was opposed to the spread of slavery to new territories and new states. Uh, but he was not exactly an abolitionist. In other words, he didn't think that the federal government had any power to abolish slavery where it already existed in places like Alabama or Mississippi. But he did think that it could and should prevent it from spreading. Um, in 1837, he said this about slavery and anti-slavery and abolitionism. He said the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy, but the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evil. So he thought abolitionism was not helpful, uh, even made it worse perhaps. He supported the American Colonization Society, which advocated freeing slaves and then settling them in Liberia, in Africa. He became a U.S. representative in 18, uh, from 1847 to 1849, so he represented Illinois in the United States Congress. Uh, there, again, he was a Whig. He favored internal improvements like railroads and canals. He favored a national bank. Uh, he opposed the Mexican-American War. Some Whigs did, some didn't. He was one of those who was against the war. He tried to introduce, well, he did introduce with a Democrat named Joshua Giddings, a bill to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia. But um, the bill didn't get any support uh, from others in his Whig party, and it was dropped. Uh, he only served one term, then he returned to Illinois and uh, dropped out of political life briefly. Resumed a political career after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, reignited the slave controversy, slavery controversy, and in 1858 he ran for the United States Senator. Um, and he uh, was defeated by uh, Stephen Douglas, but won the admiration of Republicans all over the country, and ended up being selected as the Republican nominee for president in 1860. Um, I should have mentioned this just a few seconds ago, but I will now. So he um, was nominated for senator in 1858 by the Republicans. This is the campaign he lost. And he gave a really important speech called the House Divided Speech. And this is kind of presaging the future. It was a reference to a Bible verse, of course. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. That was in 1858. So in 1861, jumping ahead, Lincoln has won the election. And in March... Uh, on March the 4th, 1861, he is inaugurated president. And he faces a situation no other president has faced. Several states have seceded and have formed a new country, the Confederate States of America. So he has to deal with that in his inaugural speech. And he talks about slavery. He talks about secession. He talks about many things. He says no authority, the, the federal government, has no authority to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. He also pledged to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, and he supported a proposed constitutional amendment to protect slavery in states where it already exists. He said all those things in his inaugural address. So he's trying to reassure um, people in slave states like Kentucky and Virginia that have not seceded yet, 
that he has no intention of abolishing slavery whatsoever. He says, I can't. I have no constitutional authority to do so. And he says he has no inclination to do so, no desire to do so. He's trying to reassure them so that they won't secede like South Carolina and some of the other states have already done. And he's also, I think, even hopeful that maybe if he reassures them, then maybe some of those states will have second thoughts and uh, undo their secessions or whatever. But he did say this. He was opposed to secession. He pledged to defend the property and places of the U.S. government. And he said the Union could not be dissolved and secession was unconstitutional. So he refused to acknowledge the legality of secession itself. And his idea, it was rebellion, uh, not secession. He said he would not strike the Confederacy first. He would not be the first to, to, to start a war. But he would defend the United States against the use of force by the Confederacy. This is a quote from Lincoln about the, his, his insistence that he had no desire to end slavery where it already existed. If you look at the bottom here, it says, I declare that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. And then he says, We are not friend enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Of course, that proved to be uh, too optimistic. So the Civil War began shortly afterwards on April the 12th, 1861, Confederate forces fired on Union troops at Fort Sumter in South Carolina, and this began the Civil War. Fort Sumter is down here on this map. Notice how important, again, South Carolina is in all of this. Even going back 30 years prior, South Carolina had been the state that promised to secede or threatened to secede during the battle with Andrew Jackson over tariffs. And... <clears throat> South Carolina was the state with the highest concentration of slaves. In other words, slaves uh, made up the biggest proportion of people compared to free people in South Carolina. South Carolina was more dependent upon slavery than any other state in the South. And South Carolina was the first to secede in 1860 and then the first to fire shots in 1861. So it was really at the center of all of this for many years. Um, and there's a picture of Fort Sumter there on the left. So on April 15, Lincoln called on the states to send a total of 75,000 volunteer troops to recapture forts, protect Washington, Washington, and preserve the Union. This call forced some states to, to choose sides. Virginia seceded, and the Confederacy then moved its capital to Richmond, so the capital became Richmond, Virginia. Then North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas followed over the next two months. Four slave states remained in the Union, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri. Uh, so you can see on this map, Four of these states that had been waiting to see what would happen, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. And these were slave states, but they had not seceded until war broke out. They were kind of waiting to see what, what, would, what would occur. And then the other four slave states, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland, uh, stayed within the Union throughout the war. Now I want to talk about um, a couple of the generals and just introduce them to you who are going to play a major role in this. Robert E. Lee would eventually become 
the most famous and the most important of the southern generals. And he was an interesting character, an interesting figure, and a very controversial figure uh, these days and even during the Civil War. His family was famous. Uh, his father was Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, and he was a close friend of George Washington. And Lee married um, a woman named Mary Anna Custis Lee, who was a great-granddaughter of George Washington's wife, Martha. So in a sense, he married into the Washington family, uh, and he was, and his family was famous uh, in its own right for its service during the American Re Revolution. He then, uh, when he was a young man, he went to the uh, United States Military Academy. He graduated first in his class, if I remember correctly, at the Military Academy. And then he joined the Army, and he served in the Army for uh, the next several decades. He served in the Mexican-American War. He was one of uh, Winfield Scott's uh, chief aides in the march from Veracruz to Mexico City. And he played a very important role in several American victories in that war, mostly through reconnaissance. And what he was exceptional at was finding routes to attack the Mexican army that the Mexican army hadn't anticipated were even there or available. Uh, for example, there was one famous battle where uh, Santa Ana had left undefended a path through the mountains uh, that would kind of come up behind the Mexican army where they were waiting to ambush the Americans. And Santa Ana had figured there's no way the Americans can find its way through the mountains and up around behind us. And Robert E. Lee did. And he essentially turned what should have been an ambush for the Mexican army into an ambush against them or a surprise attack against them. So he distinguished himself with his service in that war. Uh, and then in 1852... He, was, he spent three years as the superintendent of the military academy. Uh, and then in 1855, I think he was appointed to uh, head some cavalry in Texas. So he served in Texas for a little while. Uh, but when Virginia declared secession from the Union in 1861, Lee had to make a choice. Uh, he opposed secession. And kind of like Jefferson, he said he opposed slavery although he did have many slaves and their uh, records indicating that his treatment of them could sometimes be brutal. But he said he opposed slavery and was ha would be happy to see it abolished, and he clearly opposed secession. Nevertheless, when Virginia seceded, he decided to accept command in the Virginia Army and not one that was offered to him in the U.S. Army. Uh, Winfield Scott approached him and offered him overall command of the Union armies, and there are many people who think that if he had accepted that offer, the war might have been much shorter, uh, but he didn't. He decided to, to, to go with Virginia. Ulysses S. Grant was his great rival, especially at the end of the war, the uh, rival of Robert E. Lee. He was raised in Ohio. He was admitted to West Point. Um, he graduated 21st in his class. He was, an, uh, he was regarded as exceptional with horses, but maybe not necessarily um, exceptional at classwork. But he served with distinction in the Mexican-American War, just like Robert E. Lee did, although they don't appear to have really known each other. They met once, perhaps, but never really were friends or anything like that. Um, Grant fought first in Texas um, at the Battle of Palo Alto and at the Battle of Resaca de la Palma. These were two of the first battles of the war that were fought in South Texas. Now, he had an interesting experience in the war. He spent most of his time as a quartermaster, which means he was in charge of basically keeping track of the supplies and making sure that the men had plenty of supplies. And he was reportedly unhappy with that work. He preferred to be leading charges and engaging in fights, combat, which he did get to do a little bit of, or some of. But most historians think his experience as a quartermaster turned out to be very, very helpful for him when he was general in the Civil War, uh, 
because he understood the logistics of how armies operated. He understood the need for supplies and things like that. Um, he got married in 1848 and had four children. He left the army in 1854, uh, basically because he had a drinking problem. And his uh, superior officer made a deal with him that if he couldn't stop drinking, he would resign. And he broke the deal, I think, within a week or so and resigned. Uh, he went into civilian life, uh, tried to become a farmer, and didn't, couldn't, didn't succeed at that. Spent about four years trying to succeed at that. Uh, and then went into his father's leather business with his father and two of his sons, two of his brothers and back in Ohio. Uh, but basically, after leaving the army in 1854, it was seven years of poverty for he and his wife and their four children. And then the war broke out in 1861, and he volunteered for service. And he and Robert E. Lee had something, all, something else in, com something in common, for the first year of the American Civil War, they were both serving in relative obscurity. Uh, Lee was considered an old man, and he was kind of disdained by the Confederates, and Grant was just considered a nobody. Uh, he had you know, shown some potential in the Mexican-American War, but had been out with a drinking problem for years, and he had trouble even getting back in. Um, it, so it took both of them a while to win any acclaim in the Civil War. So now for the war itself, let me talk briefly about the resources. Now, this chart on the left is good for showing you the basic discrepancies in Union and Confederate resources. So the North had more people, 71% of the population, and it also had more railroad mileage. And that was hugely important because that makes it easier to transport armies and goods, weapons and supplies. The North had more manufacturing plants, far more, 86% of them, and more industrial workers. And this turned out to be hugely important. Uh, for example, before the war broke out, just before the war broke out, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, who was teaching in Louisiana, told the Southerners down there, if there's a war, you're going to lose. And basically said, you can't even make your own shoes. You can't even make your own clothes. The North can make all of those things. And uh, that's why they'll win. And he turned out to be right. Now, how to pay for the war um, is, was an interesting question. So the North paid for the war through the, a variety of methods. One, high excise taxes, which means sort of they're kind of like sales taxes, taxes on goods. So they also had high taxes on imports. The Moral Tariff Act taxed, duties, uh, taxed imported goods. They also printed paper money. $450 million in paper money was printed, and these, this paper money was called greenbacks. And they sold government bonds to banks and individuals. Government bonds were like loans, right? You could buy the bond, and essentially you're loaning your money to the government by doing that. Uh, the National Banking Act of 1863 chartered national banks to purchase government bonds to use as backing for banknotes. The South also tried to raise money through excise taxes and the sale of bonds and the issuance of paper money. And they also tried to seek loans from Europe. But they didn't have success. The North had a great deal of success financing the war. The South had very little. Um, the bonds no one would buy because people didn't want to loan money to the Confederacy because there was no confidence that it would survive. The loans from Europe were hard to get because, again, European banks didn't want to loan money to a government they thought might collapse any day. So what the South did basically was it printed paper money, and it printed so much of it that it steadily and quickly lost value until four years later, by 1865, it was essentially worthless, and it was very, very hard for the South Southern economy to function and for the southern government to supply its army with shoes and clothing and uh, what it needed to fight the war. Now I want to talk a little bit about civil liberties during the Civil War on the Union side. Um, and a couple of famous incidents will help 
get the idea across. So, on, all, on April 27, 1861, Abraham Lincoln authorized General Winfield Scott to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Remember, this is an ancient English doctrine, habeas corpus, that entitles you to a hearing, a trial, so that you cannot be held indefinitely without being accused of a crime. So what Lincoln was doing was basically authorizing the general to seize civilians and to hold them indefinitely without charging them with crime. Right? It's the suspension of law. Now, one of the legal problems, one of the constitutional problems with that is that the Constitution authorizes Congress to suspend the habeas corpus, but not the president. But Lincoln did it anyway, uh, and the military did it through him. So uh, a guy named John Merriman, pictured here on the left, had denounced Abraham Lincoln. He, was, he lived in Maryland. He denounced Lincoln. He praised the South. And he raised a company of soldiers for the Confederate Army. <clears throat> and he was also accused of, or allegedly involved in the destruction of railroad bridges needed to transport Union troops. So he was clearly helping the enemy or trying to help the enemy. He was arrested on May 25th and taken to Fort McHenry outside Baltimore. His lawyers sought a writ of habeas corpus from Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger Taney. Taney ordered the fort commander to bring Merriman before the court the next day. That's how a writ of habeas corpus works. The judge issues the writ and it says, bring me the prisoner. Show me why you're keeping him. Tell me why you're keeping him. The fort commander, George Cadwallader, refused, saying that the army had suspended the writ of habeas corpus on President Lincoln's authority. Taney responded, I can only say that if the authority which the Constitution has confided to the Judiciary Department and judicial officers may thus, upon any pretext or under any circumstances, be usurped by the military power at its discretion, the people of the United States are no longer living under a government of laws, but every citizen holds life, liberty, and property at the will and pleasure of the army officer in whose military district he may happen to be found. So Merriman stayed in jail at Fort McHenry. Uh, he never got a trial. He never got a hearing. Uh, the army ignored the Supreme Court justice, chief justice when he asked them to explain what was going on. Um, Lincoln defended all of this. Now, obviously, there were people then, just like Chief Justice Taney and people today, who think that Lincoln exceeded his powers, violated the Constitution by having the army seize people and hold them without trials. Um, first, though, he, he defended himself in a speech to Congress or a letter to Congress. Um, first, he denied that his suspension of habeas corpus was unconstitutional. He claimed that even though the Constitution had said under the article addressing congressional powers that the writ of habeas corpus could be suspended in times of invasion or insurrection, it didn't say that presidents couldn't do the suspension. And Congress had not been in session. And so he thought it only makes sense that you interpret the Constitution to allow me, the president, to suspend the writ of habeas corpus while there is an insurrection. So he didn't think he had violated the Constitution at all. And he said, even if I did, he doesn't think he did, but even if I did, one provision of the Constitution should be violated to preserve the existence of the Union itself. In other words, Merriman was a part of a conspiracy to overthrow the government right, in Maryland. And he needed to act to preserve the Union and... Uh, that justified basically whatever he had to do, even if it was technically unconstitutional. Merriman was not the only person who was seized and held without trial during the Civil War. There were about 2,000 or more people. Most of them were from Maryland. 
and they were held at Fort McHenry without being charged, put on trial, or allowed the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, this Richard Bennett Carmichael is one of these people. Let me give you this story just as an example. He was a circuit court judge in Maryland, and in November 1861, federal officials arrested three men charged with interfering with the election process after they heckled unionists at a rally. So make sure you understand that. There were three men who saw a union political rally, pro-union, and they heckled the participants, like yelled things at them. And so the army arrested them and put them in jail. Now you might think that's an exercise of free speech, but the army considered it treason. So opposed to the arbitrary arrests and abuse of civil liberties, Carmichael instructed grand juries to indict the persons who made or abetted such arrests. So he's saying this is a violation of free speech, and people should be arrested or uh, if they participated in seizing these three people. As a result, Secretary of State William Seward ordered Judge Carmichael's arrest. On May 27, 1862, Union Army General John Adams Dix issued orders for the arrest of Judge Carmichael, now suspected of being a Southern sympathizer. More than 125 deputies and soldiers surrounded the courthouse. Two of them entered the courtroom and seized Carmichael. One of them, named John Bishop, beat Carmichael over the head with his pistol until the judge was unconscious. He was dragged out of the courtroom, taken to Fort McHenry, and held there for six months, and never accused of a crime. So that happened to about 2,000 people uh, in the north during the war. One of the uh, people, another person this happened to, uh, Frank Key Howard was the grandson of Francis Scott Key, the guy who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. He spent 14 months in jail for criticizing Abraham Lincoln and the Union. So now to the war itself, and the battles and that sort of thing. So the Union had a three-part plan for winning, devised by Winfield Scott. It's called the Anaconda Plan. Anaconda plan. The first step of it was a Union blockade. They wanted to uh, s prevent southern ships from reaching Europe, basically, with cotton to sell. They were extremely successful at this, and by 1863 or so, had really ground all cotton sales to a halt, and the South was being starved economically because of the success of this Union blockade. Another step was to capture the Mississippi River, and you can see the blue arrows here. And by doing that, they would control um, one of the more important transportation routes in the South for, uh, for uh, commerce, and they would split the Confederacy in two, separating Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas from the rest. And then the third part was focusing on the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia, and capturing it. The first real battle of the war was the Battle of Bull Run on July 21, 1861. There were 18,000 soldiers on each side. All of them were poorly trained. Um, at first, the Confederates were driven back, but a Confederate general named Thomas Jackson held the line against the Union troops and organized a counterattack, and he was nicknamed Stonewall Jackson ever afterwards until his death two years later. The Union troops then began to withdraw and panicked, and it was a rout and they fled all the way back to Washington, D.C., several miles away. This battle was important because it showed one thing. There were about 3,000 casualties, about 460 Union killed, about 387 Confederates were killed. But although this would pale in comparison to the death rate at later battles in the Civil War, it was still shocking to the people at the time. They had literally expected something like a picnic. And many Northerners, in fact, had followed the Union Army and had set themselves up on hills around the battlefield with 
picnic lunches, expecting a good show. And when it turned out to be a bloody rout, um, the civilians and the soldiers all fled all the way back to Washington. And people began to suspect that this would be a far bloodier and far longer war than they had anticipated. In the West, Ulysses Grant quickly made a name for himself, or in 1862 he made a name for himself, winning some important battles. He won the Battle of Fort Donelson on the Tennessee River, uh, or on the Cumberland River. And winning this battle, he issued a ultimatum to the Confederate Army. He demanded that they uh, uh, give in to an unconditional surrender. And after that, his nickname became Unconditional Surrender Grant, a U.S. grant. And he began to get notice in Washington by Lincoln. One of the biggest battles of the war was the Battle of Shiloh one of the bloodiest battles of the war. In fact, it would later be replaced by Antietam and Gettysburg as bloodier battles, but at this time, it was the bloodiest battle in all of American history. There were 1,754 Union soldiers killed and 1,728 Confederate soldiers killed, and there were over 13,000 casualties on both sides, meaning killed and wounded. The battle started uh, with what looked like a rout for the Confederates, and they were very close to winning a major, major victory. But on the second day of battle, reinforcements arrived for the Union side, and the Union side ended up pushing the Confederates back and winning the battle. New Orleans fell to a Union uh, Navy commanded by Dev David Farragut, in April 1862, and this was a major turning point in the war. New Orleans was the largest Confederate city. It was very important uh, for the Union blockade that they capture New Orleans and take it out of Confederate hands, and capturing the New, the New Orleans allowed the Union to control the lower half of the Mississippi River, from New Orleans to Vicksburg. Uh, so this was one of the three or four, I think, turning points in the war in the North's favor. Another battle of historical interest that really didn't have anything to do with, how, turn, with changing the outcome of the Civil War, but for historical purposes, the Battle of Hampton Roads between the Monitor and the Virginia was very interesting. This was the first meeting in battle of two ironclad warships, two non-wooden ships. Uh, they rammed each other and shot at each other for three hours, and there was no clear victor. They just kind of quit fighting. <coughs> but uh, this caught the attention of navies around the world. I remember reading once that when the British heard about this battle, uh, they immediately halted orders for new wooden ships for their navy. They realized instantly that wooden ships were now obsolete in naval warfare, and once they heard about this. And France did the same thing. Now in 1862, the guy on the left, George McClellan, the Union uh, general, launched the Peninsular Campaign to try to take Richmond. And he came within just a few miles of Richmond, uh, the capital. And at that point, uh, Robert E. Lee was given command of the, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, he was replacing a guy named Johnston who was temporarily wounded. And this is where Lee went from relative obscurity to fame as a Confederate general. He attacked McClellan repeatedly in something called the Seven Days Battles and drove McClellan 80 miles north away from Richmond and basically drove him out of Virginia and all the way back into Maryland. Lee decided to follow up his victory with an invasion of Northern Territory. 
he decided to invade Maryland. And this led to the Battle of Antietam. Again, this is between Lee and McClellan. And what Lee wanted to do was he wanted to he wanted to put the pressure on the north. He wanted to take the war into northern soil. He hoped that a major victory there would cause the northern civilian population to turn against the war and would make uh, Washington decide to negotiate some sort of a peace. So the battle lasted uh, all day, September 17, 1862. It was the bloodiest day in American military history, and even to this day, if I remember correctly, even deadlier than D-Day, for example. There were almost 4,000 killed and over 20,000 casualties on both sides. At the end of the day, Lee was forced to retreat back into Virginia, meaning that the battle was technically a victory for the North, although it was really kind of a tie. But that was enough of a victory to allow Abraham Lincoln to issue a major proclamation called the Emancipation Proclamation. He had been waiting for a victory, and Lee had been defeating McClellan kind of over and over again for several months, for about three months. But this was the, the first, uh, you know, plausible victory he had had. And so he issued the Emancipation Proclamation promising to liberate slaves in Confederate territory on New Year's Day, 1863, if the South didn't um, put down its weapons and rejoin the Union. At the end of 1862, the North decided to attack Virginia again. McClellan had been fired. Lincoln was tired of him and chose a guy named Ambrose Burnside to command the Army of the Potomac. And Fredericksburg was a town in northern Virginia. So the Army of the Potomac, the Union Army, crossed into Virginia and attacked Fredericksburg. And this ended up being a massive defeat for the North. They suffered twice as many casualties as the South did. And on December the 13th, the height of the fighting uh, made uh, General Burnside ordered waves of feudal assaults on a Confederate position behind a fortified ridge on a place called Mary's Heights. And I think this is what this picture is supposed to be showing you here. This is the Union Army, and there was a low ridge with like a, a stone wall, and the Confederate sharpshooters were just sitting behind it, and wave after wave of the Union soldiers were just sent running towards that ridge, hoping they could get to it before they were all mowed down. And they were all mowed down one wave after another. It was just an hour of carnage, right? Hundreds, maybe thousands of Union soldiers dying. It, it got so <clears throat> bad that at the end of the attack, uh, the story goes that Burnside realized what a catastrophe it was and what a horrible thing he had just done, just sending you know hundreds of people to their deaths for no good, all in the space of one hour. And he ordered one last charge and insisted that he was going to charge with the men at the head of it, meaning probably he intended to commit suicide, to be shot down with them. And his officers seized him and pulled him away and canceled the charge, and he never commanded again. On, June, excuse me, on January the 1st, the southern states had not put down their weapons and rejoined the Union. So Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, what this did was interesting. Some people misunderstand. It did not declare all slaves free. It did not declare slavery uh, banned or prohibited in the United States. It declared all slaves who were under in areas under Confederate control to be free. So the slaves in New Orleans were not set free because that was under Union control. The slaves in Maryland or Kentucky or Missouri or Delaware were not set free because those were Union states. But the slaves in Georgia, where there were no Union armies yet, or at least not much, they were set free. 
So in fact, on the day it went into effect, it set almost no one free anywhere. Right? Um, but the idea was, going forward, once we take those ter territories, we can put this proclamation into effect and liberate those slaves. So it did end up freeing hundreds of thousands of slaves over the next two years of the war. It had another effect that was maybe even more important. It changed the perception of the war around the world. So in Britain and in France, where there had been many people who were sympathetic to the Confederacy, they now began to see the war as being about slavery. Up until then, Lincoln had steadfastly said, the war is not about slavery. If I can end the war without freeing a single slave, I'll do it, happily. But now the public perception was it is a war about freeing slavery, because if the Union wins, they will free the slaves that are being held in the Confederate, uh, in the Confederate territory. Here you see a picture of uh, some of the almost 200,000 black Americans, mostly freed slaves, who ended up fighting for the Union uh, during the war. A lot of times what would happen is freed slaves would join the Union Army and then serve in the Union Army in, war, in battles uh, in 1863 and 1864 and up until the war ended. Uh, this is a picture of Stonewall Jackson, <coughs> and <coughs> he was the most famous of the Confederate generals, except possibly for Robert E. Lee himself. And one of his greatest hours was at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and, and for Lee too. Now, at this point, the Union commander was named Joseph Hooker. So they were going through guy after guy trying to find someone who could beat Robert E. Lee. McClellan couldn't, and Burnside couldn't, and now Hooker got a chance. And his army was bigger than Lee's army. The Union army was always bigger than the Confederate army. And he crossed the border, the river, to enter Virginia. And Lee did something uh, that was contrary to every military accepted military strategy of the time, he divided his army in half and then attacked the larger army. And the tactics of the day had said, never attack the opponent when they have a bigger army than you do. And if you have a smaller army than he does, never by any means divide that army in half. That's just suicide. You're already smaller. You're just diminishing your chances even further. But Lee decided to be bold and to do something they would never expect. Uh, so he divided his forces. He sent Stonewall Jackson to make a surprise attack, and it worked. And Jackson routed the Union Army, and uh, Hooker was forced to retreat. But this victory turned into a tragedy for the Confederate side. That night, or one of the nights of the, this battle, Jackson decided to do some personal kind of scouting of the Union positions. And on his way back to the Confederate side, he was shot by a Confederate uh, sentry who thought he was a Union guy, thought he was in the North. Uh, he was shot, and he eventually died of his wounds. And to some extent, the South never recovered because Lee depended on him so much. And now we get to Lee's biggest, I would say, biggest blunder of the war and I think the most important battle of the war, the Battle of Gettysburg. So this was Lee's second attempt to invade the North. The first had been Antietam about one year earlier, and now he's invading Pennsylvania. And his objective, again, he, he has different objectives. Uh, he wants to basically seize supplies in Pennsylvania because the Confederate Army is already running out of supplies. They're beginning to fight without shoes and that sort of thing. He also wants to put pressure on Washington, D.C. He figures if he can win a battle in Pennsylvania and threaten Washington, D.C., he can force the North to negotiate an end to the war. In, on the Mississippi River, Vicksburg, an important Confederate city, is under siege and about to collapse. 
and he wants to divert attention from that uh, by invading the north. So he invades. The battle lasts three days. And you can see <clears throat> this map of Union of the, the battle lines on the third day, the, the kind of uh, uh, pinnacle of the fighting. The Union is in blue, and the Confederate lines are in red. So the Union had what the historians often call a fish hook kind of formation here. And the, the Confederates had tried all day on July the 2nd to break through the Union lines up here and had failed. And then on the third day, the last day of fighting, they would try one last disastrous charge right at the center of the Union lines called Pickett's Charge. Let me see if I have a picture of that here. But this is the aftermath. So the climax of the battle was when General Pickett, at Lee's orders, took 12,000 Confederates and attacked the center of the Union line. What they had to do was walk across an open field, about a mile and a quarter long, and when they got to about halfway across this field, they were in range of Union artillery and sharpshooters, and their goal was to somehow make it all the way across the field and attack the Union line before they were obliterated. And mostly they just got obliterated. Um, some of them made it all the way to the other side, but only a fraction of them. Most of them were wiped out. And from the accounts that I've heard, this gives you a little bit of an idea, but there was so much artillery fire, so much gunfire, that the sky was blotted out. It looked like a thunderstorm or something, where it was just smoke from all the artillery and all the guns. Um, and there were dead bodies everywhere. It was a tragic, it was a, a huge um, defeat for the Confederates. One historian said Gettysburg was the price the South paid for having Robert E. Lee as a commander, meaning most historians think that at least on the third day with Pickett's charge, Lee was way too risky and gave away too many of his men's lives for nothing. So on July 4th, the next day, Robert E. Lee and the Confederates had to retreat to Virginia, and Lee would never attempt to invade the North again. This is one story from the Gettysburg Battle that I like to tell that's kind of interesting. Um, after the battle, a civilian in Gettysburg found a soldier, saw a soldier, who was lying on his back, and in his hand, on his chest, he had propped up a tiny photo of these three children. And what had, died, what had happened was he had been shot, and he had realized he was going to die. And he had pulled out of his pocket a picture of his kids, and he had kind of propped it up on his chest so that he could look at it as he was dying. And this picture was published. No one knew his identity. The only clue they had was the picture that he was holding in his hands when he died. But a uh, newspaper in New York printed a copy of the photograph. And for several days or several weeks, it was kind of a you know, sensational story in the North. Who was this soldier who had died? His widow saw the photograph. Um, she lived somewhere in New York, if I remember correctly, and recognized it. And it was her husband, Amos Humiston. And the picture was, of course, of their three kids. And so it's kind of a personal story about um, some of the people who lost their lives fighting in this battle. At the same time that Gettysburg was a huge defeat for the Confederates, they suffered another huge defeat several hundred miles away in Vicksburg. So the Vicksburg was a city on the Mississippi River, <clears throat> and Ulysses S. Grant had had the city under siege for several months, and it fell on July 4th, 1863. The same day, basically, that Lee was forced out of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, to retreat out of Pennsylvania, was the same day that the Mississippi River fell to the Union Army as well. So two huge uh, turning points for the North. A few months after 
the battle at Gettysburg. The decision was made to make the Gettysburg uh, battlefield into a national cemetery. And Abraham Lincoln went there to give the Gettysburg Address. And I'll just read you a couple of lines from this. It became obviously one of the most famous speeches in American history, maybe the most famous. But he says, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Notice how he describes the United States. So four score and seven years ago is 87 years earlier. So it's referring to the Declaration of Independence. And he's saying this country was conceived and dedicated to an idea. Right? Unlike any other country in the history of the world, this country was born because of an idea. And the idea was that all men are created equal. Now remember, in the South now, they had decided that all men were not created equal, that Thomas Jefferson was wrong. And Lincoln is saying that's what this war is about. This war is about whether or not that's true, or whether or not a country dedicated to that idea can survive. So at the end, that's what he talks to. He says, um, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. A lot of ideas were back in there. He thinks that the soldiers who died at Gettysburg died so that this nation could have a new birth of freedom. And I think he's referring there to the Emancipation Proclamation, to the end of slavery, and he's kind of saying that's what the war is now about. It's about freedom. But it's also about government of the people, by the people, for the people, that it shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln had always said that if he allowed the southern states to secede, it would be the end of democracy. Because any time any state didn't like something was going on, it would just threaten to secede. And the union would be on stable, it would always be uh, at risk of falling apart, and democracy wouldn't work. And so that's what he's referring to here. Now, <clears throat> Grant had taken Vicksburg, and he was promoted to overall command of the Union armies, and that set up several months of fighting between Grant and Lee themselves. And you can see these battles here. Without going into the names of them, although they're interesting, they're fascinating in and of themselves, but what happened was Grant tried methodically for several months in the middle of 1864 to capture Richmond or Petersburg, two major, obviously Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, and Petersburg, a major city in the Confederacy as well. And so Grant would attack, and Lee would uh, stop him, and then Grant would move a little closer and attack again, and Lee would stop him. Grant would attack again, Lee would stop him. And Grant was continuing, continually trying to outflank Lee's army, to get around it and get to the capital, Richmond. And Lee was continually blocking him. And in all of these battles, the Union was suffering twice as many casualties as the Confederacy was. Grant was losing two times the number of men that Lee lost in all of these battles. But Grant knew something <clears throat> that Lincoln had known from the beginning. I think Lincoln called it the terrible mathematics of this war, which was that the Union had more men than the South did, and it could afford to lose them. It would just keep getting replenishing his army, keep getting new soldiers. But for the, every soldier that Lee lost in the South, there was no replacement. And so eventually, Lee's army would get ground down to nothing, while Grant's army would continue to get reinforcements from Irish immigrants and you know northern farm kids and so forth. So Grant, and, that, and knowing that, 
Grant did something that McClellan and Hooker and Burnside had never done before him. Even when he lost, he just kept attacking over and over again, knowing that eventually Lee would run out of resources. Um, <clears throat> towards the end of this campaign, around June, July, 1864, it settled into a siege. Uh, they built trenches. And if you've ever seen movies or pictures from World War I, <clears throat> it looked a lot like the trench warfare of World War I. Uh, the trenches went for miles and miles around Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia. And for several months, there was no real activity. It was just trench warfare on both sides. The breakthrough in the war was in Georgia. <clears throat> William Tecumseh Sherman invaded Georgia from Tennessee in the summer of 1864. He faced two Confederate generals. First, General Joseph Johnston, uh, who was outnumbered two to one by Sherman, fought a kind of retreating uh, tactical series of battles to try to keep his smaller army between Sherman and Atlanta to prevent Atlanta from being captured. Um, the Confederate government got tired of Johnston because they wanted him to attack Sherman, which Johnston knew was, would be suicidal. So they replaced him with a guy named Hood, a Texan named John Bell Hood. Hood did what they wanted. He launched a series of frontal assaults against Sherman's army and was defeated. And that left Atlanta open, and it fell on September the 2nd, 1864. Sherman then marched to the sea. He marched his army 300 miles from Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia, and he and his army destroyed everything in their path. In a quarter 300 miles long and 60 miles wide, uh, everything they found that was of military value that could be used to support <coughs> Confederate armies, they destroyed or burned or whatever. And this is where you hear, see the beginnings of what we call now a scorched earth policy. What Sherman wanted to do was ruin the South's capacity for continuing the war. And he was successful. You see Sherman's march to the sea here. And then he continued that policy going up through South Carolina and then northeast uh, into North Carolina. The victories in the South saved Lincoln's presidency and the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln, in the summer of 1864, had feared that he was going to be defeated. And he had been preparing. For, he was despondent, depressed. He figured he was a one-term president. He figured the Democrats nominated George McClellan, who Lincoln had fired for uh, being too timid. And the Democrats wanted to negotiate a peace with the South and just let him go. But after the fall of Atlanta, northern spirits surged. Lincoln ended up winning election, re-election fairly easily. By 1865, it was obvious that the South, South was um, in its, on its last legs. Lee was appointed general-in-chief of the armies of the Confederate States. One idea that came around that was kind of interesting historically, but didn't amount to much, they were running out of manpower, and Lee was in favor of freeing the slaves and training them for military duty and letting them fight in the Confederate cause. But this was February 1865, and the war was over before these new trainees could make any difference. By April of 1865, <clears throat> uh, Lee's army was down to about 28,000 men. Grant had about 100,000 men. And Lee was forced to abandon Petersburg and Richmond. He no longer had enough money enough men uh, to defend them. He tried to retreat about 100 miles to the west. Uh, he was hoping to hook up with other Confederate armies and continue fighting. But Grant was able to surround him. Lee tried to break out of the Union uh, circle and failed and agreed to surrender 
on in April of 1865. It took a while for all the other Confederate armies to follow suit, but most of them surrendered as soon as they heard that Lee had done so. They realized that the war was over. And then kind of a uh, unhappy conclusion of that, just five days after Lee surrenders, uh, Lincoln decides to go to the theater with his wife, and it's Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., and he's shot by a Confederate sympathizer named John Wilkes Booth. This was part of a larger plot, not just to kill Lincoln, but to kill the Secretary of State, the Vice President. Uh, the only part of the plot that succeeded was the murder of Lincoln. Uh, he died the next morning, April the 15th. Um, and Booth was caught and killed 12 days later. And that's it. I'll see you next Monday.